The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Hello and welcome to The People's View. Today we're going to talk to David Gervais. He's uh, associated with the Business and Industry Association. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Carl. Thanks for having me on the program. Well, we want to find out a little bit about your organization and uh, how, how you think uh, the uh, uh, economy is going to go after this uh, problem we've had with the virus and everything. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, problem. That's one way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly different. Um, yeah, well, let me tell you, your uh, viewers a little bit about the BIA if they haven't heard of us, the sure. Business and Industry Association. We serve as New Hampshire statewide chamber of commerce. So we're set up very much like a local chamber of commerce, like the Greater Salem Chamber or the uh, Merrimack Sauhegan Valley Chamber in, in your area. We have uh, member companies that pay uh, dues to the organization, and uh, we provide business advocacy and business education services. We serve as the business voice at the state house and get actively involved on legislation that could have either positive or negative impacts on the business community. And uh, how many members do you have? We have a 400 plus members, but keep in mind that's companies. And uh, we represent uh, some of the state's largest companies mm -hmm. all the way down to uh, sole proprietors or single owner operators. So we really run the gamut. And the difference between a local chamber is our members are spread out all over the state. We have members as, as uh, far north as, as Berlin and Colebrook. We go over to Keene and uh, Walpole. We're certainly heavily, um, uh, we have a, a large number of members in Southern New Hampshire and and a, a large number over on the seacoast. So we're really statewide. So how do people get in touch with you if they wanna to talk to you or about uh, your, your operation? Well, our members uh, know how to reach us directly. Uh, they all have my phone number <laughs> and you hear from them frequently either by phone or via email. If the public wants to get in contact with us, I would encourage them to go to our website, which is BIAOFNH.com, like BIA of New Hampshire.com, BIAOFNH.com. And uh, they'll not only learn more about the BIA and the positions that we are advocating for, but there's a staff list that explains who's who in the organization and what areas they're responsible for. Good. And what what do you consider uh, the biggest issues in the legislation this year as uh, for your organization anyway? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a it's an interesting session like uh, sessions when you were up at the right. state house. There are a lot of bills, well over a thousand were submitted for both the House and Senate. They're being whittled down. For the BIA, our uh, highest priority issues deal with establishing what we call a legal safe harbor. This is to protect businesses who mm -hmm. are doing the right thing, who are complying with both federal and state health and safety guidelines from falling victim to um, uh, litigation related to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's certainly among our highest priorities. We're also very active on the right to work issue. This is a legislation that if it were passed, it would make New Hampshire the only state in the Northeast US to be a right to work state. And what that means is no individual employee uh, could be forced to join a labor union or pay agency fees to that labor union for representation. And why that's important in terms of uh, being the only state in the Northeast, we know there are a lot of companies, hundreds of companies throughout the country that have indicated to their site location specialists mm -hmm. that they will only expand uh, or locate in right to work states. So if New Hampshire isn't among those states and there's 28 of them mm -hmm. around the country, primarily in the Midwest and the South, well, then we're not even a part of the discussion for attracting business here. Well, I, I agree with you there. I think we need to have that growth and that possibility, that 
condition to grow is very important, but... Uh, yeah, we consider it one of the most important economic development bills of the session. And unlike many other bills, it doesn't cost the state anything. It right. doesn't cost anything to become a right-to-work state. And it will give employees the right to choose. If, if they feel the union is providing value, then they're going to want to be a member of the union yeah. and contribute to that union. But if you're an individual that doesn't feel the union's providing value. We don't think you should be forced into paying paying a part of your compensation to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you think you have a good chance of passing it this year? I know uh, I, I was up there since 2008, and we tried every year, and we haven't made yeah, it. Yeah, well, um, it's already passed the Senate. It passed on a yeah. 13 to 11 vote, which is... Um, a close vote, but it's still a majority. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's gotten through one chamber and is will make its way over to the House. We're not expecting the House to take it up until sometime past crossover, which is, right. as you know, when, yeah. when uh, the House takes up Senate bills and the Senate takes up House bills, that's in early April. Uh, and it'll be a struggle. You know, obviously, labor unions are... Uh, quite agitated about mm -hmm. this legislation and they're pulling all out all the stops to to um, defeat it. But we've got advocates in our corner too, a number of businesses and other trade associations who are supporting it. So mm -hmm. we'll duke it out in the house, just, oh. like, just like the old days. Well, that's good. Yeah. It's, all, it's like 27 states that have the right to work. Isn't that right? Or something? Yeah, I think 28. 28 now? 28 states, okay. I believe so. Yeah. And, uh, but, but none in the Northeast, right. certainly none in New England and, and none in the Northeast. So mm -hmm. New Hampshire would really be a standout state if we were able to pass it. Well, that sort of goes to the New Hampshire attitude too of uh, having a lot of choices for how to work or how to do how to live. And uh, yeah, but I don't want to underestimate the power of organized labor oh, in this no. state. No. Like I said, they're pulling out all the stops, so mm -hmm. it'll it'll be quite a battle in the House. Yeah. And uh, what other things are are you looking at? One other bill that people may not have heard a lot about, but it's a really important issue. If you were a company uh, business that received a Paycheck Protection Program mm -hmm. loan, this is was a part of the Federal CARES Act from mm -hmm. uh, last year and was intended to help a company supplement uh, their payroll needs to keep people working. If you had that loan forgiven, which was, again, a part of the federal program, mm -hmm. uh, at one point there was... Um, confusion about whether that uh, money received was taxable. And the federal government quickly made that clear <laughs> in the most recent act that it was not taxable. Oh, okay. They never intended for it to be taxable. Oh. And so they passed legislation at the federal level to deal with that issue. Oh. But it's still an issue at the state. Our own Department of Revenue Administration recently put out a tax notice saying that this revenue you received is taxable under the business profits tax, and they are anticipating anywhere from 100 to $130 million in tax payments oh. because of that. Now, keep in mind, this is 100 or 100, $130 million coming from the state's smallest businesses that were <laughs> hammered by the pandemic. So oh, we boy. asked for legislation to uh, make it clear that that money is not taxable under the business profits tax. It's currently in the Senate. It's Senate Bill 3 uh -huh. for your uh, viewers who want to look it up. It's in the Senate Ways and Means Committee right now, and we are working hard to try and get that legislation through, but it's early in the, early in the game. Yeah. Well, that sounds like something that's very important, and uh, you got to straighten out some of this stuff. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really critical to uh, New Hampshire's smallest businesses. They don't need... They don't need to be, they've already been hammered. They don't need to be ham kicked again when they're down. Right. So we hope that the Senate will act on it. Senate Bill 3 is, is, uh, well, it's, it's funny how the, the people don't think the, these, uh, programs all the way through, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the yeah, the really in the original CARES Act, it was a complete right. oversight. No right. one was really, they, what, what they were thinking about was how do we get money to uh, small businesses as mm -hmm. quickly as we can? Mm -hmm. And they never stopped to think about the tax implications until the IRS <laughs> mentioned it. And at that point, uh, to, to their credit, our, our um, House and uh, our Congress uh, people, yeah. House and senators, House members and senators, said we never intended for that to be taxed. And they right. quickly passed legislation to make that clear. But right. 
We need to do the same thing at the state level. Well, they having other problem in other states so that too, or are you coordinating? Yeah, every, it really, it impacts every state. That's yeah. a great question, Carl. Um, we already know that states around us, Massachusetts and Maine, are working on legislative remedies or fixes. Uh, I heard recently that 25 other states around the country are also working on fixes, but it's a, a very new issue that this tax uh, guidance from, from our a tax department, the, the uh, Department of Revenue Administration, only came out two weeks ago. Uh -huh. So this is a very um, late emerging issue. And I think states around the country are, are, are working on how to deal with it. Yeah, I hadn't heard about it uh, before. So I thought that was uh, something that only recently came up. Yeah, it's 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 very recently. It's not necessarily a new issue because it stretches back to right. last year, uh, last year's Paycheck Protection Program. But it's a new issue in terms of businesses being made aware of it. And I guarantee you, every tax accountant and tax attorney in New Hampshire is very <laughs> aware of it at this point. I can imagine. But speaking about taxes, what about the taxes that uh, are changing or not changing? Uh, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting issue. There are two different bills mm -hmm. in the uh, legislature. Uh, the House bill is House Bill 10. The Senate bill is an omnibus tax bill, Senate Bill 13, that does a number of different things, but both uh, bills have something in common. They want to lower the business profits tax and the business enterprise tax uh, to, to uh, levels that existed, I'm guessing, maybe going back 10 years or more. Mm -hmm. And they were part of the original uh, tax reduction right. plan that Governor Sununu started that um, sort of came to a screeching halt is the only way I can describe it. Mm -hmm. There was um, a provision in the um, budget from two years ago yeah. that, that uh, uh, at that time, Democrats controlled both the House and Senate. And uh, obviously the governor being a Republican was in the corner office and they couldn't come to consensus on, on whether the next phase of business tax reductions should go through. The compromise that they eventually arrived at was that if tax uh, revenues were coming in 6% higher than budgeted expectations, uh, the, the next phase of tax reductions would go down. If tax prediction, um, predictions were 6% below mm -hmm. Uh, budgeted expectations, tax revenue six percent below budget, then the tax rates would actually go up. Mm -hmm. And if they were in between those two thresholds, the tax rate will stay the same. Well, during that time, the pandemic hit, yeah. and we thought oh, the timing couldn't be worse right. on this um, because we were afraid that would throw tax revenues uh, uh, below the six percent uh, projection. Fortunately, they did not go below that. It was close. I think they ended up in at the end of the accrual, at the end of the uh, fiscal year, um, they ended up at like 5.2% below, yeah. so lower than project projections, but not low enough to trigger a tax increase. But the result was the tax rate stayed the same. So businesses, both large and small, never saw that benefit of yeah. that final planned reduction. Both House Bill 10 and Senate Bill 13 seek to to uh, lower the tax rates to that final step. Mm -hmm. Now, the governor also has a tax reduction plan that he mm -hmm. included as a part of his budget um, message. And that proposal is a little different. He seeks to only lower the business enterprise tax. So that'll be helpful to the small business community, but it won't do anything for larger businesses or business profits taxpayers, because even if their BET goes down, mm -hmm. as you know, from your uh, years on ways and means, that's used as an offset against the business profits tax. So their the BET they pay may go down, but the BPT will go up at exactly the same rate. It's a wash. But so we, um, we appreciate the governor looking out for the state's smallest businesses. Yeah. Uh, but we are supporting either the House or the Senate bills, which which provide tax relief for, for all companies. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that tax relief is amazing, isn't it? Every time you had it, you came out with more money than you projected. Oh, yeah. It was interesting because um, over a four year period that those tax reductions were phased in. Mm hmm the um, amount of revenue that accrued to the state 
was in the hundreds of millions of dollars more than budgeted. Right. So they, you know, they, as you know, from the budgeting process, every, every budget starts with revenue project projections. What, mm -hmm what they reasonably expect to take in, in in all forms of revenue, the business taxes, rooms and meals tax, cigarette taxes, everything. Um, and the revenue from the state's two business taxes, the BET and the BPT, increased dramatically. I, I, can't, I can't underscore how dramatic this right. increase was over the budgeted expectations, even though the tax rate was going down. Well, it helped us fill our rainy day budget uh, area a lot. Which I is think. full to overflowing, yeah. which thank goodness, because right. there was a, you know, since the uh, pandemic, the budget budget revenues have not been performing as well as we would like. Although business tax revenues, interestingly, are still performing very well, but other revenue sources, important revenue sources like the rooms and meals tax, which is well, I think, you know, yeah. heavily tourism based is is really hurting. Yeah, well, obviously nobody wants to travel anymore. <laughs> They're yeah, I mean, about you know, all states are discouraging travel, but right. even people that live here don't probably go out to eat as much as they used to. Oh, and definitely. They're certainly not staying in hotels or lodging. So yeah. it's that's been impacted pretty A severely. Lot, yeah, but I think uh, the more money that you leave with the people who are doing these businesses, is find some way to use it to enhance or uh, at least stay uh, uh level of somehow uh, well and it couldn't come at a at a, at a better time because let's face it there are a lot of companies that are still struggling even with all the federal and yeah. state assistance mm -hmm. and there was significant assistance from the state especially to main street businesses small businesses um theaters uh entertainment venues but you know, just think of it, Carl, if you had a business and you've been shut down for almost a year, oh, yeah. <laughs> what what impact <laughs> that would be, you know, that that's hard to bounce back from. Oh, it is. It is. But uh, we're a, really a research and an active uh, state. I, 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 you know, I moved up here from Massachusetts a long time ago, but uh, uh, it's much more comfortable for me to be in this kind of environment, I find. We try to be a state that is... Uh, you know, extends open arms to business community, uh, large and small, because let's face it, if you're employ an employer, you're providing jobs and, mm -hmm. and that's what people in the state need is, is jobs. So, you know, anything the state can do to help out in this very difficult time is, is greatly appreciated by the business community. I think the business, uh, the um, administration of the state has been going pretty well. And I understand from the, uh, a governor's budget that he is trying to reorganize and slim down the administration. Do you find that uh, helpful or not? Yeah, one one thing that was in the budget proposal that we you know had did not receive advance notice of was was combining all of the administrative functions right. of all of the state's uh, higher learning centers. So that would be UNH, the university system, mm -hmm. Keene State College, all of the community college systems. I think the governor referred to there being eleven different administrative units to to uh, uh, administer all of these different. Um, institutions of higher learning and he wants to to combine that into one mm -hmm. uh, honestly we're still evaluating that proposal and uh, uh, we don't have a position yet but in general we think that that type of um, uh, uh, combination of administrative functions is helpful one one of the reasons that New Hampshire um, a lot of money that's spent in public education across the uh -huh. state is because for a, for a state our size, we have an unusually large number of, of administra administrative school districts. And uh, everyone knows why, because everyone, every town wants to have their own administration yeah. because they don't want to combine resources with neighboring towns, or that doesn't happen very often. And that's fine, but the result is you're, you're, you know, you're spending a lot more money in administrative costs than you otherwise would have to. Yeah, they're the high paying jobs, too. That's uh, one of the reasons, I guess. I know uh, when they come out with the uh, all, all all the public uh, offices and what they're getting, the charges uh, like 85 percent of them are from the educational background. 
administration. Yeah, although I, I have to admit, Carl, I don't necessarily fault the educational community for that. I mean, let's face it, we're in competition oh, yeah. for the best talent, for the best professors, the best administrators. You don't want a, a yokel <laughs> in the position of administering your, your school system. And, you know, when you're in competition for for people like that, you're going to have to, and many times, match salaries or try to match salaries. And well, so we, we could argue about whether they're being paid too much or, or not enough. But I'm not I'm not arguing about them being yeah. paid too much. I'm saying too many are getting too much. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's uh, I, I will grant you there's a lot of them, but it's because, you know, yeah. the tradition we have of local control in the state okay. extends to that. And yeah. everybody wants their own local administrative unit. And, and well, we'll see how that goes. Oh. Uh, it'd be, it's going to be interesting to see how well, how easily he can combine all that. Yeah, so, yeah, and and like I said, that was a concept that had not been floated in public before he made his announcement. Mm -hmm. uh, was I, you know, for example, I said we're we're still vetting it. We're uh, meeting with with um, you know the university system and and so on, and listening to their thoughts. I don't know how the individual schools, community colleges, and so on feel about that proposal, but we'll find out soon. Sure, sure. Well, anything else in the uh, legislation area that, that's of interest? Yeah, there's a lot of other uh, what I call labor-related bills or employment oh. law bills that that uh, your viewers should be aware of, especially if they own businesses. Um, there are several different bills to raise the minimum wage. One uh, that the House Labor Committee is dealing with would raise the minimum wage to twenty-two dollars and fifty cents. Oh. I don't. <laughs> I think that's going to make it through. Um, yeah. But there are other bills. Another bill, I think, raises it, I think, to either 12 or $15 over a phased-in period of time. Um, you know, our position on the minimum wage is, well, threefold. First of all, there are almost no jobs in New Hampshire that pay the minimum wage because competition for labor is too high. If you're Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's and you're paying 11 or $12 an hour, you know, no one's going to work for $7.25, right. which is the current minimum wage. So in one sense, we think it's a moot point. In another, if you're raising the minimum wage, that creates a ripple along the whole wage spectrum. Because if, if let's say you were making $12 an hour yeah. and, and now they raise the minimum wage to $12 an hour, you're not going to be very happy with that. You're going to yeah. want to be making more than the minimum right. wage. And so there is a ripple effect. So our belief is if the minimum wage does get raised, it should happen at the federal level. That way it impacts employers throughout the country in the same way. Nobody has any advantage over any other employer based on geography. And that may have sounded far-fetched <laughs> a year ago, but now it's, I think there's a very real possibility that the minimum raise, uh, minimum uh, wage could be raised at the federal level. But one of the big arguments against that doing at the federal level is that the uh, economy is different priced at uh, different pl places and, uh, you know, uh, the cost of living is a lot higher in some places well, those, than others. Uh, you know, that's true. But let's face it, the cost of living in the Northeast is higher than it probably oh, definitely, is in Alabama. Yeah. yeah. But, you know. <laughs> but the, the, there's a cost of living between, from what I hear, between the North Country and the South is is dramatically different, right. and that's true of very many states. It, it's it's not an easy issue, um, but the reality is that you know the money doesn't grow on trees, and no matter what you raise it to, it's going to be the employer that has to pay it. And what does that mean in terms of of job growth? Yeah. That's right. Uh, and that's that's one thing because it's a as you say it's a wave. Uh, uh, the, you have the businesses have to get a profit, so they're going to raise their prices, and that's going to cost you something more, too. Another interesting program that the governor announced that we are evaluating relates to paid family leave, and he has a proposal to create essentially a new state employee benefit where they can get up to six weeks of paid family leave. I think it's set at 60% yeah. of their salary. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about his proposal is private sector employers, if they want to provide the same benefit, can buy into that program. In fact, under his proposal, even individual employees, if, if the company they're working for doesn't buy want to buy into it, individual they employees yeah. can buy into it. So, 
you know, one of our objections all along to paid family leave is the, the mandatory aspect of it, forcing companies to participate and forcing employees to participate. And we could just never support that. Mm -hmm. But this more volunteer driven type program uh, working off of a new state benefit is, is something that probably deserves some some serious consideration. It does. I think that's one of my problems with it, too, when they originally proposed it, uh, you know, the force. Again, we like to have a little choice. And some people do <laughs> yeah. it. And let's face it, as far as I'm concerned, I think employers are the best at putting together benefits programs mm -hmm. and, and salaries too, for that matter, mm -hmm. that they, th this is a very competitive uh, market for, for labor oh, yeah. and employees everywhere are seeking the best uh, workers they could find. And they know what they need to do in terms of providing a benefit package and providing a salary to mm -hmm. draw, to draw top quality labor. So we're always more comfortable with employers making that decision rather than the state trying to decide for them. They know how to negotiate with some of those uh, insurance companies a little bit better, I think. Yeah, but the, the beauty of, I think, the governor's plan is they're using a significant number of employees, state employees, oh, yeah. to develop that program. Mm -hmm. And then, employer, you know, if you're an individual employer and you have, you know, two or 300 employees, that makes you a pretty big business by New Hampshire standards. Right, right. But it's a drop in the bucket <laughs> by okay. insurance That's company right. standards. Right. So if we can buy into a program that that has already, you know, 10 to 15,000 people yeah. enrolled in it, uh, that makes it that makes it easier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we're, you know something? We're getting close to the end of the time. So is there any other issues that you'd like to bring up quickly or... Uh, I enjoy uh, just that the, there's a lot going on at the legislature. Right. It's easier than ever for people to keep track of it because uh, everything's online now. Uh -huh. The state house is shut down to the public, but you can watch everything online. You you are not required to testify. You're not even required to sign up. Just just uh, to go to the general court website, look at the links, and. And listen to what's happening, because I guarantee you, it, it is something that could impact you. It is. It's going to be interesting seeing how the uh, uh, representatives vote the next week. Is it they having this session? It's uh, the, actually it's just coming up Wednesday and Thursday. Oh, they have a Wednesday, marathon Thursday. session. Yeah. Okay. So that's going to be fun. Well, we'll be talking to you again later on when it gets closer to June, when we're trying to uh, settle all these odds and ends of the round. So thank you very much, David. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate being on your show. Thank, thank you. you. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.